Thank you to all of you. It's an honor to be here. I'm Ramez Nam from Singularity University. And what we're going to do over the next uh, few hours is I'm going to talk for about an hour. Uh, we can do a little bit of Q&A, maybe give you a short break then. And then we're going to come back and have a workshop where you at your table is going to take some questions from uh, the themes of my talk and try to apply them to your businesses. And then we'll read out each table. Someone will have to stand up and, and talk about uh, what thing you, you came to or what crazy idea you had. So uh, the talk title is Exponential Innovation, but really it's about the intersection of technology and business. And that means innovation, it means disruption, it means how you organize internally to achieve those results. So for context, I'm the co-chair for energy at this organization, Singularity University, where we have a, a pretty audacious goal. We have the goal of empowering people to use what we think of as exponential technologies to improve the lives of a billion people. And if you think about it, technology is what has improved the lives of billions of people around planet Earth today. I have um, a background before that. You could say I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up, if I ever grow up. I spent 13 years at this company, uh, worked directly with Bill Gates and others along the way, in and out of stints of that and running a startup. I've written five books. Three of them are science fiction novels, which is actually a very fun thing to write. And an interesting thing about writing science fiction and also working in the area of uh, trying to look at disruptions coming in the future is people assume that science fiction is actually effective at predicting the future. But in fact, science fiction does terribly at prediction. But on a good day, good science fiction can provoke some, some bigger thoughts, if you will. But I think that we fail in our look at the future in fiction, especially in a systematic way, which is we tend to assume that the structure of things is just like it is today, the structure of uh, society frequently, how we live as humans, but we've built new things that are bigger, better, faster, etc. So the Starship Enterprise can go faster than light to other galaxies, but it's still fundamentally human beings living in a way not very different from now that are doing this in this massive uh, ship. And what's actually happening in space is that instead of bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, the biggest change is we're building smaller. These are CubeSats. These are one kilo satellites that because electronics have shrunk so much in their size and power, you can do with this what it took a 100 kilo satellite to do uh, 10, 15 years ago. You can launch one of these for about 40,000 US right now. There are high schools in the United States that have done this as a class project. It used to be that only governments or very large corporations could have their own satellite in space. Now you could if you wanted to. Well, here's another um, way to think about the transition. If I say the word drone to you, a decade ago, what did you think of? You might have thought of something like this. This is the, the US Reaper drone. This is a, a Predator drone they attached some missiles to, basically. And the Predator drone started out at $4 million. This starts out, this now, maybe it's 20 million US dollars uh, to get one of these. But that's, when we say drone, this is no longer what people think of. People think of this device, you know, $400, a little over 1000 for the nice uh, DJI Phantom 4 right now. So for the price of one of these, you could actually have 20,000 consumer level drones. And now these are changing the world. This is a company that came out of Singularity, Matternet, uh, delivering supplies in Haiti uh, where the roads had washed out after an earthquake. Or now in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have this. This is Zipline. And this is in Rwanda. Rwanda is a very mountainous country. And in Rwanda, only about one quarter of uh, the population is in areas well served by roads. So getting medical supplies and blood to them is complicated. Blood's especially complicated because you have to refrigerate blood and you have to have uh, your uh, type and RH negative or positive. And so if you're in some remote clinic that doesn't have electricity, uh, you might just be out of luck. So Rwanda now has the world's first uh, entirely covering the entire nation drone network for delivering medical supplies. If you're in any remote clinic in the country, uh, within 20 minutes, they can get blood of your type 
to you. Uh, this is a, a real flight of, of one of these drones. That's the future. And the walk away price of these drones is not disclosed, but it's probably a couple thousand dollars, something like that. So technology, yes, we build these bigger and bigger and more expensive things, but the bigger change is that we are learning to make things smaller and faster and cheaper, and that's hugely disruptive. And nothing is moving us towards uh, faster and cheaper more than digital technology. Digital technology has transformed even this, right? Driving has been a, a human behavior, and now it's becoming something that software just does better. The, the Google self-driving car has driven now about 3 million kilometers. Uh, 16 accidents that we know of in, in Google's vehicles, 15 of them caused by humans. So it's not a perfect vehicle, actually. It, it has some limitations. It's not operating on snow yet and so on. But within the scope of what it does, it's simply a better driver than a human being because it has LiDAR, so it has 360-degree vision around itself. It uh, can make decisions in microseconds that it takes us whole seconds to make. Now, how many of you have gotten to ride in a self-driving car? Okay, well, I will take you into a self-driving car and just show you what it's like, in particular in an American-style self-driving car. So here's uh, what it's like to ride in one. We can't see when they're this. Oh, my goodness. Go is the right word. Holy shit. Holy shit. There's no fucking hands on that wheel. Oh, my God. What? I like to say that that's the scream of the oil futures market, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Um, of course, it's not, it's not usually like this. Self-driving cars can drive slaloms better than any human, uh, but they're actually they're not made for that purpose. They're made as family vehicles. And now it's getting real. Google, their Waymo division, has uh, 500 of these vehicles in Phoenix, Arizona, that has a, a ride-hailing service. Uh, General Motors realized they were late to the game and that Google and Tesla were ahead of them. So they did what any large corporation would do. They acquired a startup. This is Cruise Automation. And when Cruise hit uh, about 18 months of age, General Motors bought them for $1 billion US dollars. All right. And now in San Francisco, about 500 Cruise employees wake up in the morning, use an app. They don't own these vehicles. The employees don't. They use the app, and one of these vehicles comes to their home, picks them up, and drives them to work. And by the way, uh, Waymo, Google's division, has now been licensed in two different states, in California and Arizona, to run a for-profit autonomous ride-sharing service. That happened just in the last month. So when will they launch that? We don't know. GM has said they're going to have an autonomous taxi service, Uber-like service, with the cruise platform running in 2019. All right. And this isn't just the future. Uh, if you have a Tesla Model S, you can do this. This is a 2016 Tesla Model S where the owner has just, he's punched in uh, the address he wants to go to, or maybe he's spoken to it, and it's just driving itself. And you can see in the right-hand side the different kind of object detection it has of what's going on. Again, this is level four autonomy. You're not going to drive it on the snow or in a storm, perhaps. It, it still has limitations, but... It's going to get there, and it's already a better driver than we are. And around the world, a million people a year die from collisions with vehicles. It's actually a much, much larger cause of death than all murder, all warfare around planet Earth. Right? In the U.S. alone, Americans spend 50 billion hours a year operating vehicles. If you take the medical cost of injuries, the cost of property damage from collisions, the lost days of work, and a, a small hourly wage for driving, it's about one trillion US dollars that could be disrupted by all vehicles being autonomous. And what happens to the auto insurance industry if accidents go down by a factor of 10? So this is major disruption that's happening. And all of the disruptions that I just talked about are really driven by one thing, uh, Moore's Law. How many of you know Moore's Law? Moore's Law is one of the most important observations of a trend that affects the future. So Gordon Moore was the founder of Intel Corporation, and Moore observed that the number of circuits they could fit on a chip was doubling 
every year or so. In fact, it was sort of actually a marketing claim to be able to, to sell more chips. He had to tell uh, someone that they were going to sell to that he thought they could double it again next year and double it again the year after that. Uh, but it was also a historical observation of some sort. But if you take that, now we think of it in economic terms. We think of it in how much computing do you get per dollar. <clears throat> and the basic way to think about it is every decade you get a hundred times more computing per dollar, or the cost of computation drops by a hundred x. Every 20 years, it's 10,000 x. Every 30 years, it's a million x. That is not a future prediction. That is an observation of what has happened over the last 30 years and more. Right? Here's a, a simpler illustration of that. I went to the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. This is ILLIAC, the world's second digital computer. It was built there in the mid-1940s during World War II. And here's an obsolete smartphone. It's an iPhone 6. Right? The ILLIAC uh, was much larger than this room, a few of these rooms. It weighed tens of tons. It drew uh, tens of thousands of watts of power. And the smartphone weighs tens of grams, draws milliwatts of power, and yet is hundreds of millions of times more powerful than ILLIAC. If you wanted to build something as powerful as my phone with ILLIAC technology, it would have a footprint uh, substantially larger than Prague. It would be kilometers tall. It would draw more electricity than all of Central Europe, actually. And it still couldn't Snapchat or play Angry Birds or whatever it is you wanted to do. There would be no one to Snapchat too, because it would take the entire global GDP to make one of these. So the even simpler way to think about that is that the cost of computing goes to zero. The cost of computing, the cost of data storage, the cost of data transmission. And then on top of that, you get new business models where the cost goes to zero. The cost of uh, disintermediation goes to zero. The cost of connecting people goes to zero. So we think about this at Singularity in terms of these six Ds, that when you take a domain that used to be analog and you digitize it, whether it's taking photos or driving, then at first it's deceptive. It looks like nothing really is going to happen. Then it's disruptive. And then this whole domain gets dematerialized, and capital assets matter less, and soft assets, data and networks, matter more. And then it gets demonetized. What used to be very expensive gets really cheap. And then it gets democratized, and technologies and capabilities that once only nation states or multi-billion dollar corporations could afford get into the hands of small startups and in the hands of individuals. And that's tremendously transformative to the world. Let's talk about deception. Uh, mobile phones. We all know mobile phones have changed the world, right? They're a great example of an exponential technology. But the leading forecasters of telephony didn't see it coming. This is Vinod Kosla. He founded Sun Microsystems. He's a billionaire venture capitalist in Silicon Valley now. He made this chart. Uh, this is how fast mobile phones uh, took off in just a few years, from you know, 1998 to 2010 or something. And you can see it's fairly exponential. These lines are the consensus forecasts of the world's leading experts on telephony, of what the growth would be. They all thought it would flatten out. They all thought it would go linear. And in fact, in subsequent years, as it's accelerating, they all keep lowering their forecasts for the rate of growth. So Kodak looked at this and said, what the heck? Why would we even consider such a thing? We have the amazing uh, top of the line uh, SLR cameras on film is great. You get 24 shots, man. It's fantastic. You get only one shot on this. And you can't, you can't print these pictures, right? But here is how many pixels you get per dollar. And it was. 0.01 megapixels, 10,000 pixels, and now it's you know, 40 million pixels. So it's followed the exact same law as Moore's law. The number of pixels you get in a picture per dollar has gone up 100x every decade. So this is what we mean by deceptive. You start off in this valley of disappointment. You have a new technology. The old technology, the linear one is here, film, photography. The digital technology starts Really, it, it seems to start down here. It looks totally worthless, whether it's uh, digital photography or digital music or AI or self-driving cars that didn't work at all. No self-driving car had gone more than seven miles in 2005, right? 
Uh, but then, because they get better exponentially, at first, uh, taking that digital camera and going from 100 pixels to 200 pixels to 400 pixels to 800 pixels, it still didn't matter. It was still below the line of performance of the best linear technology. But when it crosses over, it has tremendous momentum. And it's going up and up and up. And then suddenly you say, oh, this is a black swan. We couldn't have predicted this. This came out of the blue. It wasn't a black swan. You just didn't do the math. Or you did the math and you didn't believe it. All right? So that's one of the core lessons we'll come back to, is don't be deceived by something that's inferior today. If it has the better growth rate, it is what will win in the long run. So then these technologies become disruptive. This is Mark Andreessen. Mark uh, founded Netscape. He wrote the first web browser himself, NCSA Mosaic. And now he's a billionaire venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. And he has this phrase that I love, software is eating the world. In fact, uh, this is an essay you should go read. You can go look it up on his blog. And what he's saying is that in domain after domain, what used to be done by humans or used to be done by capital is now being done by computation. Right? Software is eating all sorts of things. It's eating games. We, uh, humans used to be the best chess players. IBM beat humans at chess decades ago. But we have this other game called Go, Chinese game that's trillions of times more complex. They thought AI could never win. And then just two years ago, Google, with something called AlphaGo, beat uh, Li Sedol, the world's champion chess player, uh, four games to one. A few months ago, Google released a new version of this, AlphaGo Zero, that beat AlphaGo a hundred games to zero. All right, that's the pace. This is all, that's machine learning. It's a new form of AI where you don't program the AI, you just give it data. You show it examples of what a good board look position looks like and a bad board position, and then it figures out how to play on its own. But this is not a great business model. There's only so much money you can win uh, at chess or Jeopardy or Go. It's sort of a relatively small market. Uh, so what market do people hope to apply this to? Well, one of them is healthcare, right? Four trillion dollar global market. You know, we have some people here that have thought about healthcare. And so now you see things like this is a headline uh, from uh, December. New algorithm can spot pneumonia better than a radiologist. They have software, again, machine learning, where they've just fed it uh, tens of thousands of chest x-rays and a human has, doctor has already labeled these chest x-rays and say this was pneumonia, not just pneumonia, it was actually 15 different pulmonary diseases. And at the end of learning from that, it does better than human doctors on all of those diseases. And it can make the decision scalably like that. Right? And it can make the decision if there's no doctor nearby. If there's a technician in a remote area that gets an x-ray and then uploads it to the cloud, the AI can say immediately what it is without having to wait for a doctor to wake up or come see you in microseconds. Right? That's disruptive. Or uh, if we come back to science fiction, you know, we have Luke Skywalker in Star Wars flying his x-wing. But the reality is software is eating space, right? We'll never let a human pilot one of these vehicles. How many of you saw the, the A, some SpaceX launch? All right. I'm going to tell you what's so important about the SpaceX launches. <clears throat> this launch, I'm going to show you a video of it in a moment. This launch, a launch of this type, costs about 100 million US dollars. The fuel in this vehicle costs a few hundred thousand. US dollars. Airlines fly, fuel is maybe 40% of their cost, so 2 to 3x fuel cost. So at the same ratio, if space travel was as efficient as airlines, this should cost $1 million. It should cost 100 times less than it does. Why is it so expensive? It's so expensive because we throw away the vehicle every time, right? Imagine if you took a flight from here to the US or here to London, and they threw away the Airbus at the end. <laughs> What would the ticket cost you? <laughs> a whole lot. I mean, that's a $300 million vehicle. So you're, you're talking about a million dollars for coach. Like, that's what we're talking about. That's basically the situation now. So this launch, the most amazing thing, it's not the liftoff that's the most amazing thing.
all of that's amazing, but we've done that before. This is the important thing. That's the important thing. And that's software. If software can nail this repeatedly, and it's getting close, they landed two out of three of these, right? They've stuck more than half of their landings lately. If software can do this repeatedly, it can lower the cost of space by a factor of 10. Could you ever have imagined that using software, you could lower the cost of launching things into space by a factor of 10? Right? That's not, we don't think about a technology that physical as being disrupted. Here's a better, a better view. This is an older landing, but it makes it more clear that Luke Skywalker will never be the way we go because no human could stick that landing. It will be software that does this for, does this for us, and that's massively disruptive. Or a more practical industry, the way that we make stuff, 3D printing. This is a direct metal laser sintering device. It's in a powder bed of metal, uh, steel or aluminum or even titanium nickel alloys. And basically, we can digitally design a product and have it printed right there. And now these, these pieces are going into finished goods. This is no longer just prototypes. And your supply chain shrinks to zero. Yes, yeah, actually, it's not quite as fast as a factory, but it's a lot faster than ordering something from a factory. Now, the U.S. Navy is putting these on all of its large warships so that if something goes wrong and there's some piece missing on the ship, they don't have to wait weeks to get it back from base. They can make the part right there and be operational again in a few hours. And so now we're doing this for high performance. This is a high temperature fuel injection nozzle for tiny objects. This is the scale that we can print on. For fashion objects, this is a 3D printed metal high heel plated in gold. The 3D printer itself plates it that way. Uh, for super high performance, these are the engines on SpaceX, not the big ones, but the engines on the crew capsule. Uh, are 3D printed in this titanium alloy. They get shapes they could not get with any other method. They get a weight performance ratio they could not get with any other method. And they can print them every day. So they model what they want to do, and they print, and then they test fire it and see if it was, does what they want. Now there are companies with technology to uh, 3D print buildings. Right, this is a lot of stuff in the building construction industry that gets in the way of this sort of thing. But the basic technology is a concrete printer that goes around and can make walls, and it leaves in spaces for the, the pipes and the electrical to come back in. So we can now just do things that we couldn't do before. And you better bet that whatever that device costs today, the price is going to drop and drop and drop over time. A lot of my work is in energy, and so energy itself is also full of exponentials. People in general buy the cheapest energy they can access, uh, and if we look at solar power, uh, 40 years ago it cost two, uh, $77 for one watt of solar panel material. Now that's 30 cents, 250 times cost reduction. The first 100 times cost reduction didn't matter, because it was still more expensive than coal or gas anywhere. It was in that deceptive zone, right? But then it crossed through a barrier, and now there's a crossover. Building a new coal plant costs about six US cents per kilowatt hour. In the southwest of the US, without subsidies, we have deals at three quarters of that price. Here's the cost of 20 year contracts for solar power in the US, dropped by a factor of seven or eight over the last decade. In India, the country people thought most would see coal consumption rise, we have solar deals for building new solar plants a third less than the price of building new coal plants. Four times price reduction in solar there. We have in Mexico below three cents, half the price of coal. In Abu Dhabi, I, this is one of my favorite pictures of all time, actually. We had, one of you is from Abu Dhabi. Is it you, Paul? Okay, yeah. Uh, so you know, there's more money than God there, among other things. But they, <laughs> I, I think the, the MENA region actually sees the need for this sort of disruption. And so you have uh, what was the world's record low price until about three months ago, about a third the cost of coal in some countries. Now Chile has beaten this price even. So you have the cost of solar just plunging, plunging, plunging through this red line that is the cost of uh, building new coal or gas, right? So we, the zone of uh, deception was basically everything before 2013, they were in that deceptive zone. 
oh, it sucks, it's no good, it'll never get better than what we have today. And then suddenly it breaks through and everything changes. And you'll see again that forecasters are terrible. Experts in a field are terrible at predicting this kind of disruption. They know too much. I'll show you this. This is the IEA, the International Energy Agency, the world's experts on energy, part of the OECD. Right? The IEA is not what I would call an exponential organization. And I'll show you. Here are their forecasts for the growth of solar over the years. In 2002, they made this forecast. They said, it's going to be amazing. Solar is going to grow to 50 gigawatts by 2030. We had 400 gigawatts in December. In 2004, they said, we're a little bit off. We have to raise our forecast. In 2006, they said, we're a little bit off. We have to raise our forecast. Every single year, they keep raising their forecast. It's like some analyst is looking at their spreadsheet and hitting copy, paste for the formula for the next year, right? And they still don't get it. They see linear growth that will install the same amount every year when, in fact, the growth is exponential. Or energy storage. You all know who this guy is? Tony Stark? <laughs> He's the closest thing we've got. Uh, Elon, like, Tesla isn't really a battery company, actually. Uh, this is actually a battery case full of Panasonic cells. Right? And so the reason that they were able to bring this product to market isn't that they had any sudden scientific breakthrough. We'll leave that to Paul and, and Nia Power. Uh, it's that batteries themselves have had a long exponential price reduction trend. So the cost of lithium ion batteries has dropped by a factor of 25 or 30 over the last 30 years. And again, the forecasters miss it. This is a list of forecasts made in 2013. Here's the US Department of Energy saying the cost of batteries is going to be incredible. It's going to drop by a third over the next 30 odd years. And in fact, the price of lithium ion batteries has dropped by a factor of five since 2010. Right. And with technologies like NIA's and others, there's a possibility of even far beyond that. And so that, in turn, uh, disrupts transportation. Right? Now transportation, as batteries have gotten better, as digital has gotten better, this becomes uh, a radically different thing. Um, go back 10 years in your mind and imagine electric car. Well, imagine what you thought an electric car was 10 years ago. Did it look something like this? Right? Like, would you be embarrassed riding in this thing? <laughs> Could it get up to highway speeds? I'm not really sure, actually. Could it go 30 kilometers? Maybe. And now Tesla came in. And Elon's brilliant, because most disruption comes in from the low end. But yeah, I won't in this slide. Yeah. No comment. Um, most disruption comes in from the low end. But Elon came in from the high end. He said, we're going to make a, a $250,000 sports car. That's the fastest sports car in the world. We're going to use that to fund an $80,000 luxury car that's really the best car in the world in a lot of ways. And this car is the best car in the world for a lot of reasons people didn't appreciate that a car could be. So it is, in a lot of ways, it's a computer on wheels. And it updates with new apps like uh, your phone does, right? I'll give you an example of that. If you get into uh, your car that you have, it's probably a gasoline, petrol vehicle of some sort, and you start the engine and you put it in drive, you have to keep your foot on the, on the brake, right? Take your foot off the brake, the car will move forward a little bit. It's called creep. That's because the engine's running, it's producing some power. In an electric car, that doesn't happen. No foot on the brake just means the brake's not engaged. To get it to actually move, you have to hit the accelerator to give some electricity to the, to the motors. But some Tesla owners didn't like that, so they complained a bit. So one day, this is quite a while ago now, 10,000 Tesla owners woke up to an email saying, your car has a new feature. It's called creep. If you want your car to do that, just go into your settings and turn this on and it'll do that. Think about that customer experience. What would any other auto manufacturer have done? Is that, ah, buy next year's model, right? Or if it was a safety issue, they would say, oh, it's a recall. Hugely expensive, bad for the reputation of their brand. The customer has to bring the vehicle in. Tesla, because it's an electronically controlled everything, and it's a connected device. It ships from the factory with a cell modem in it that connects back to the mothership, can just do this sort of thing. 
right? Well, here's a, a more fun one. The Tesla has been the fastest street legal car for a while, actually, but Elon was never satisfied with how fast it is. So more recently, people that had the P85D or higher, Tesla Model S, got an email, this is about three years ago now, saying you have a new feature of your car. It's called insane mode. Now, are any of you Tesla owners? Any of you gotten a ride in a Tesla with insane mode? Okay, Sanjeev has, a gentleman in the back has. For the rest of you, I'm gonna show it to you what it's like, and I apologize, there might be a wee bit of profanity in this one as well. Here's what it's like. I'm, I'm really mad that the option is insane. Like, it's not like just... What? That, that's, 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 that good? that's a random, like... What's the feature? The car is insane, right? <laughs> Everyone thinks the car is insane, so why not have, you know, like an insane mode, right? It makes sense. So you just come to, like, a complete stop. All right. And then before you die, you're like, oh, oh, shit, Brooks! <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> 70 miles an hour. Brooks, oh, shit. You know, first of all, you can't fucking do that to people. Like, you gotta give people fair warning. Why? Like, you can't fucking just say, hey, Jen. Brooks, what? I think I shit it in your seat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this thing called insane? Yeah, I'm going to press it insane. I'm not going to throw up. I hope not. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Okay, I got it. Holy shit. Oh. They said right there, that's a sport and insane mode. All right. How do you got an insane on the fucking car? Isn't that great? Who puts an insane mode on the car? So basically, um, you know, you press that button. So you ain't got to worry about you stage and stage and simple car. No, you, you just say, there you go. God. Damn it, that mother. <laughs> right there. This is faster than McLaren on the store, baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it takes you by surprise, right? Boy, I'm. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. So now that wasn't fast enough. Now there's ludicrous mode. And ludicrous mode pulls about 1G when you accelerate, actually. It's, it's really, really, really fast. You heard that, that second to the last gentleman said this is faster than the McLaren at the start, right? McLaren is a supercar that starts at like half a million dollars, goes up to like two million or so on. This is an $80,000 family car. And it's faster than the like two-seater supercar. Right, that's disruption. That's because that price of batteries came down and down, the size of batteries, and because the new technology has had things that the old technology doesn't do. And that, because the price keeps coming down, that's allowed them to start selling a $35,000 passenger car. They're actually having trouble delivering to meet demand, but it doesn't matter. They've started that disruption, and now every auto manufacturer is going after this sector. Right? GM has said that they're going all electric. All right in the future. And so that takes you by surprise as well. It's still, electric vehicles are still a, such a tiny niche market. They're almost irrelevant, really, because there's 1.2 billion cars on the road roughly around the world. There's only 3 million, 3.2 really, 3 million uh, electric cars. 0.3%. It's like a pixel on a 300 pixel high bar chart, right? It's sort of irrelevant in terms of dollars spent, transport energy, and so on. But think about the growth rate. It took 20 years to sell the first million electric cars. It took 18 months to sell the second million. It took eight months to sell the third million. Looks like it'll take five months to sell the fourth million. 58% growth rate. And again, forecasters just blow it. Here is the U.S. Department of Energy, Energy Information Administration. They made this forecast in 2015. How many electric vehicles with a 200-mile range would there be in the U.S. by 2040? Right. 20,000. So with all of these technologies, whether it's robotics or energy or medicine or so on, we see this disruption happening, especially as digital moves into it. But I think the most important of these six Ds are the ones at the bottom is that over time, this leads to domains becoming demonetized and democratized. And that changes the competitive landscape for everyone as well. It's profoundly good for the world, actually, but it also has challenges. Anyone remember this movie? Wall Street, Gordon Gecko, the guy you love to hate, you know, corporate raider, he like buys companies and tears them apart, sells them for pieces. To illustrate how rich, how wealthy Gordon Gecko was, they filmed this scene. 
That's Gordon with his, his mobile phone. It's a Motorola DynaTAC. Uh, in today's money, it would cost about $10,000. It uh, took 12 hours to charge. It had a standby time of 30 minutes. Uh, no camera, no games, no apps, no Tinder uh, for poor Gordon Gecko. Here's the median cell phone user on planet Earth today. Right, a Sri Lankan farmer with a $30 Android phone that's actually tremendously better than Gordon Gecko's uh, billionaire-only phone. Right, there's 700 million phones in Africa. In Kenya, adults have nearly universal cell phone ownership. In India, it's just as high, and 300 million of those phones are smartphones that now connect to all sorts of content. MIT has said they're putting 100% of their content online for free. You can get real-time translation services on your phone and consume all the content from Wikipedia, all of MIT's courses for free in India if you have an income of $5 a day. Right? Some people worry that te technology will lead to a runaway super AI like the Terminator or HAL 9000 that will take over the world. But that's not the trend. The trend is massive democratization. The trend is 10 billion people, 7.3 billion today, all with these devices that are supercomputers that have access to super powerful AI and all of the world's information and so on. It's hugely uplifting. It's also hugely empowering. All of these people are now potential entrepreneurs. They all have the tools in hand to go launch new businesses, some of which could be quite scalable. Right? And so that transition, that empowerment, that democratization of technology produces huge upside and some downside. Let's talk about the upside. It's easier than ever to build a hugely profitable and hugely valuable business. It used to take 20 years to build a business worth a billion dollars. Now we've seen cruise automation or Oculus, Snapchat, companies reaching a billion dollar valuation in a year or two. The club of uh, unicorns, billion dollar startups, used to be almost empty, one company in 2009, and now look how crowded it is. And almost all of these are digital, but within digital, they're not actually all, there are some that are in health, there are some that are in storage, there are some that are in imagery, there are some that are in insurance, there are some that are in transport, there are some that are in real estate, right? And they're creating entirely new sectors there. That's upside. Easier than ever to create this value. Though we have selection bias, we're not seeing the 99.9% .9 of, of companies that didn't get onto this chart. We'll come back to that in a moment. But there's some downside too. 90% of the Fortune 500 from the 50s aren't there, all right? And this pace of incumbents losing their status is actually accelerating. If we look at the lifespan of companies on the S&P 500, in the 50s, it was 60 years. Now it's 15 years. The lifespan has dropped by a factor of four. Change is happening more rapidly. Easier to start something huge, easier to be knocked off of your pedestal, all right? So how do we optimize for being a disruptor rather than being one of the disruptives? Well, here's a list of 10 things that I see that disruptive companies do. And I will say at the outset, it's not about uh, money. It's not about your market power. It's not even about how uh, excellent your management is. It's really just about three things. It's about your pace of innovating. It's about your agility and your willingness to change direction. And it's about leveraging network effects, those three. And I'll give you an illustration of that, of how the strongest or the most uh, valuable or even the most advanced technology doesn't always win. This is Zheng Ha. Anyone know who Zheng Ha is? Zheng Ha was uh, one of the most important sailors ever in human history, actually. Or he's certainly one of the best sailors. Zheng Ha was the admiral of the Chinese fleet in the early 1400s. And Zheng Ha took uh, eight voyages in total, and his fleet went from China around India, Southeast Asia, the Arabian Peninsula, down into Africa. Zheng Ha came from a society that had invented the compass, invented gunpowder, all this stuff, and yet his voyages are tremendously less famous than this guy's. Everybody know this guy? 
you can guess, Columbus, right? Columbus made four voyages, though only his first really uh, matters all that much. And when you compare these guys, it's sort of no contest, actually. Zheng Ha came from a more advanced society with twice the population of Europe. He had more resources. He was a better sailor. He actually knew how big the world was. He had more resources at his disposal, and yet Columbus is the one that changed the world. All right. More comparison. This is a, a re reconstruction of one of Zheng Ha's ships. Let's put that in context to Columbus's flagship. That's the Chinese ship in the back and Columbus's flagship in the front, right? <laughs> That's the scale. Now Columbus, it's fair to say, Columbus had three, three ships, not one. Zheng Ha had 300, right? He came from a, an empire that had invented printing, had invented uh, steelwork, had invented the compass, had invented gunpowder. China had twice the population of Europe. China was incredibly well run as well. If you wanted to critique like management styles or internal corporate structure, it's actually amazing. In China, there was an imperial exam that would allow you to become a sort of a bureaucrat in the government. 400,000 people would sit for this exam and they'd be tested on mathematics and history and diplomacy and science and the arts. And the top 20,000 would become sort of the, the bureaucrats of the Chinese empire. It's actually a really very well run uh, organization, if you will. But it had one fatal flaw, which is that there was just one guy in charge at the top. This is the Hongxia Emperor. He's the son of uh, the guy that started uh, Zheng He's voyages. And Zheng He came back from voyage number eight, and this guy said, you know what? I think we're doing well enough. Like China, we're so rich, we have everything that we need inside of our borders. I just don't see the ROI on this. So let's cancel the project. And they burned the ships. Literally. Like they set the ships on fire. Meanwhile, Columbus is like the total opposite. Okay? Columbus uh, goes around for decades trying to get his expedition funded. He's from Genoa. Genoa is a great seafaring city-state. And of course, the Genoans have a statue of Columbus. We think they're proud that they backed him on his ventures, but they didn't. The princes of Genoa told him repeatedly, no, 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 no. He went to Portugal. He went to King John, said, King John, I'm going to make you the richest man in Europe. I'm going to find a route to India and bring back spices. And King John refers him to his advisors. And King John's advisors say, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. The world is actually much bigger than Columbus thinks it is, because here's Columbus's vision of the world. He doesn't believe the Americas exist. I mean, no one knows that at this time. But he thinks the world is roughly uh, a third smaller, maybe even half smaller, than it actually is. But scholars at this time know the diameter of the Earth. They've known that the Arabs knew it. The Greeks knew it. The Arabs brought it back into Europe. So they, King John's advisors are smart. They're like, no, this is not the size of the Earth. There's no way for him to reach India with what he's trying to do. So he moves on. He goes to Spain. He pitches Queen Isabella. Isabella says no. He goes through his brother, Bartholomew. He gets an intro to King Henry VII in England. King Henry says no. He goes back to Portugal again. He pitches King John again. King John says no. He goes back to Spain. Spain has been unified. Isabel and Ferdinand have gotten together. He pitches them. They say no. And then this, the legend is he's leaving town, dejected with his donkey, or thinking about which monarch to pitch next. And Isabella sends a messenger and says, what the heck? We'll fund it. Just three ships. It's OK. Small bet. <laughs> And so 50 years later, the areas in red were the Spanish Empire. Isabella was the richest woman on planet Earth. And so the lesson here is that excellent top-down management, better technology, a larger workforce, a larger war chest didn't matter. What mattered, actually, what made the difference was that Europe was extremely decentralized was that Europe was uh, willing to take more bets because in this decentralized model, each little principality could make its own bet on something. And then different technologies would cross borders and there was competition between them. And that's what led, not just to Columbus, but to the printing press, to the Renaissance, to all the innovations, not just in art and the Enlightenment and philosophy, but to the steam engine and the modern era. And that's why the great divergence happened. This is the wealth per capita of China and India over time. And here is England, right? 
That divergence in living standard was so great, and in technology was so great, that in the mid-1800s, when England wanted access to China's market during the Opium War, four British ships, this is one of them, four British steamships with new technology defeated the entire Chinese Navy. I'm not defending this episode, actually, but that's the, the it, it's a terrible episode in a lot of ways. They wanted the right to sell opium in China. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, but they had good technology. That's the gap that was built. So that's the lesson, is you have to foster bottoms-up innovation. And you're all business leaders, and so of course you're going to be proud of how clear your vision is and how much you understand in the market and where you need to go. But the best asset you have is the brains of the people that work for you. And if they're not empowered to innovate, you're wasting some of that human capital that you have. And bottoms-up innovation means tolerance for risk and failure and experimentation. Right? If we look at this unicorn club, again, we're missing the 99.9% .9 of companies that didn't get here. If you look at venture capital, Silicon Valley, most innovative place on earth, right? Almost everyone would say that. All the cool new, not all, but most of the cool new tech innovations come from there. How does it work? It works through venture capital. How does venture capital work? Venture capital works by failing a lot. This is the, of people that even get to a venture capital round, 50% of those companies are just outright failures. Most of these are actually mostly failures as well. And 6% of the deals produce 60% of the outcome. Lots of risk taking, lots of failure. Right? Now what about the very best venture capital funds? Are they, do they have a lower failure rate? No. The best funds here that produce 5x return, their failure rate is pretty much the same as mediocre funds. But the successes they invest in are more exponential. And so the 5x type returns, or the 10x type returns, make up 90% of their outputs because they're picking companies that can scale exponentially with super high margins. So the whole thing is about experimentation in a large sense. Within the most disruptive companies also, there's an incredible pace of experimentation. If you go to Amazon.com or Google or Facebook, you're being experimented on. You're in an A-B test. Somebody is seeing one version of the site, so you are seeing a slightly different version of the site or the same pixels, but a different algorithm picking what to show you, right? All of this is the result of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of experiments that have been run quantifiably on Amazon. If you go to one feature, this is one of their most profitable features ever built, the recommendation engine. And it works differently in books, in retail, clothes, and so on. All of this, tens of thousands of experiments, because there are so many different factors to take into account. Was, should you recommend by author or by people who have bought this book, also like this book, or different types of stars or genre? Who knows? The only way to know is to try a different version of the algorithm and then put it in front of users, put it in front of customers, and see, does algorithm A or B produce higher revenue or higher return rate? Right? And so the rule at Amazon is the default yes rule. If a 22-year-old engineer, fresh out of college, says she has an experiment she wants to run that she thinks will improve this, the default is her boss has to say yes, unless there's some massive cost to it. Right? And in fact, she doesn't even ask her boss. She just, they check in once a week and she says, well, here's the five things I'm doing this week. And then when she has a good result, she says, oh, this one went up 3%. He says, well, when are we going to ship it? She says, it's alive on the site now. I shipped it yesterday. That's how Amazon works. That's how Google works. Right? In fact, even things you wouldn't think of. Think about you know, what you know about page click-through. What part of the page gets the most clicks? The top of the page. right? We see that first. So Amazon used to have, when you looked at a book, the recommendations of other books used to be pretty high up in the page. And then one day an engineer said, I've got a crazy idea. I'm going to try, for just a percent of our users, I'm going to move the recommendations down to the bottom. And the click-through went up on the recommendations. They sold more books. It was broke every rule. It was totally counterintuitive. You'd never pick it as a strategy, but you would pick it as an experiment. This applies to more than just digital goods. Right? How many of you are in digital in some way? And how many of you sell physical goods of some sort? OK, not as many of you. So I can breeze through this a little bit. But even in physical stuff, experimentation is vital. This is uh, the America's Cup. Uh, sailboat race, these things are sort of miracles of modern technology. They're sort of flying wings, right? And this sport was radically changed in 1995 by this boat. 
This is Black Magic, the 1995 New Zealand uh, team boat. And just to give you a sense, the America's Cup has been held since 1851. And from 1851 to 1995, the U.S. lost twice. They lost to England once in the 1800s, and they lost to Australia once, and I think in the 70s. Right? The U.S. team, it's a pretty dominated sort of sport. The U.S. team had more money, more experience, better backers, yada, yada, yada. What did Team New Zealand have? Well, they had a third the money. So Team New Zealand picked a very lean approach. They said, look, we're going to uh, have an approach. We're going to build a really sort of sleek vehicle, and we're going to focus on one thing. We're going to innovate on this part of the boat, the keel. And we're going to invest in some crazy new technology. We're going to use computers to simulate um, how the water flows over the keel. And we're going to use that to try out different shapes. Now, that was just playing catch up. The US team was using mainframes to do this already. But the US team would try out new keels, and like once a week, they would sail a new keel. Right? These guys said, we're, we have to experiment faster. They said, we're going to have a workflow where our sailors go out and sail. They give us feedback on what it felt like and how the times were. And then we're going to simulate different types of keel. It takes us two or three hours, and we do it parallel. And then we'll pick one that we think will improve things the most. And overnight, our shipbuilders are going to fabricate a new keel. And by morning, one day later, not a week later, we'll have a new keel to sail. But then there's another problem. If you put a new keel in the boat, and the next day your time comes in a little bit worse, was it because the winds were slower, or the sea was heavier? Or was it that the new keel is not as good? So they had another innovation, which was incredibly costly. Out of their $20 million budget, I think they had, they spent $7 million to build a second boat. So they would take the new keel, they'd put it on one boat, and they'd have the old keel on the other boat, and they'd race them against each other. So they could experiment fast, and they could experiment accurately. And so New Zealand won. They didn't just win. This wasn't just, this might be the greatest upset in sports in some ways, but it's beyond that. They won 5-0. No other team in the America's Cup has ever won five races to zero. This is the most, it's called the most dominant boat in the America's Cup. The American sailing captain who'd won three uh, America's Cup himself said he had never been so outclassed in a race in his life. And the thing that did it was that they shortened this experimental cycle down to one day, and they made the experiments actually count. They made it actually accurate when they produced it. Or retail. Beta brand is a US uh, fashion brand. Uh, they, their uh, tagline is new ideas nonstop. They release about a new product a day. Right? And here's something that they, they do in combination with Lee and Fung, who actually fabricates the clothes. Sometimes, most of the time, it's not crowdsourced. It's just like click to buy. But occasionally, they run a crowdfunding campaign. And if they get about 10,000 orders for these shoes, it goes forward. But to make this easier and lower cost and faster, they have not actually made the shoe. They haven't even made one of the shoe. This is digital. Lee and Fung has an internal platform that allows them to do a high quality rendering of a piece of clothing. And Beta Brand convinced Lee and Fung, the supplier, to let them use that to put it up on the site. That means that they can uh, show stuff more quickly at lower cost, get the feedback on what's going to work. This shoe does not exist yet. This handbag doesn't exist. It's not there in the photo, right? This is not here. It looks quite realistic. But so they've taken this design the product, build it, and then test it cycle, and they've shortened it to just design the product and test it. And that allows them to move faster, right? All right, three. All of that means embracing failure or rethinking of failure. Failure is experimentation. What percentage of experiments run on Amazon on the recommendation feature lead to uh, some uplift in the revenue or the customer return rate? One out of 100, maybe. You just don't even look at the failures. You just think trying new things is part of the person's work, and when they get a result, awesome. And so that's Bezos saying, you can't have innovation without failure. When we look at an industry like pharma, it costs $2.6 billion to bring a new uh, drug to market, they say. And the reason is a huge regulatory burden, right? We have no tolerance for failure in drugs. But so the way they work this is an experimentation pipeline. They start with 10,000 molecules, and if they're lucky, one of them turns into a final product. And the late stage testing, it's like 80 to $400 million 
for testing the late stage of the drug. So a failure here is super expensive. So when we say fail fast, pharma understands fail fast because their obsession is if a drug's going to fail here, how do we know that here? That's why we fail fast, right? And so they build new platforms. They invest in technology to tell them earlier in the cycle, will this work or not? That's why if you ever hear about high throughput screening or a lab on a chip or a human on a chip. It's all about moving failures from here to here, which in a way is about moving successes from here to here, right? The flip side of that is you can't let a failure take you down. A failure can't destroy your brand. It can't destroy your entire company. You need to sandbox it in some way, right? Kids in a sandbox are safe, and so we trust them to play and do crazy wild things. It's all okay. Where is that in your uh, corporate world, right? So 3D printing is an opportunity for that. It's a new technology. can change a lot of things. GE sees that as an opportunity to employ in their engines. But GE's jet engine business is a $30 billion business. And so they worried that taking 3D printing right into this business, if it slipped the product, if it didn't work as planned, that would be hugely negative for their bottom line, right? So instead, they put it first in this business, which is uh, maybe $1 billion business for selling turboprops. Not nearly as exciting, but that let them get some familiarity. So they built this. This is the advanced turboprop engine. They took for a third of this engine, they've lowered the part count from about 1,000 to about 20. They've cut the weight because they can build shapes they couldn't build ever before. They've increased the temperature it can operate at. That means it has more thrust with less weight, more fuel efficient, goes faster. And the design time, the time to bring an engine like this to market used to be 10 years. It looks like it's going to end up being about four years for this. They're halfway in. They've flown it now. They're sort of getting out the kinks. And with that knowledge, they took it back into the GE9X, their sort of next level uh, engine for the Boeing uh, 777 and 787, right? So they had a sandbox first. This also means cultural change. You have to be willing to reward people in your organization who try experiments that don't work out and not pass them over for promotion, not penalize them in some way. Experimentation also means autonomy. If somebody has to ask permission to try something new, you're only going to get safe bets. You want people to ask forgiveness later or just surprise you with a good outcome later. And so you think about in your organization, how easy is it for a project to get greenlit versus how easy is it for a project to get killed, right? And it's usually asymmetric in the favor of no. How many of us sat, have sat in rooms like this? Come on, you don't have right. And is, it a, is, it, is consensus a big thing in your organizations? Who here hears consensus a lot? What does consensus mean? Consensus means every person here has a veto. It means if sales or marketing or operations or financial or legal or the other business unit or the other other business unit or the other other business unit, if any of them says no, it doesn't happen. Like what does that do to the pace of innovation, right? Any person can veto the thing, but all of them have to agree for it to happen. That's a recipe for nothing happening. It's actually, it's sort of similar to a problem in software. Uh, this guy, Frederick Brooks, uh, saw this thing. He wrote this book called The Mythical Man Month many years ago. It's about how adding people to a software project that was already late often slowed it down, right? Because they, they had to get their communications overhead or they had their opinions they wanted to voice. No disrespect, but the overhead grew uh, asymmetrically. He said people have this image that since we know that it takes a woman nine months to bring a baby to term, that if we want to have it happen faster, well, with nine women, we could do it in one month, right? <laughs> That's not how anything works. And it's definitely not how decision-making works, and it's not how innovation works, because the overhead grows exponentially as you add people, or it grows po polynomially anyway. It's n squared to the number of people in that room. So if you really want to, like, stop all innovation, focus on consensus. Consensus kills. So this is really good for some things, actually. But when it comes to innovation, consensus is a complete roadblock to that. Or take a book, take a page from Steve Jobs' book. When he started the iPhone team, he didn't even tell the rest of Apple for a variety of reasons. But he also gave them complete autonomy. The iPhone team had its own building. They had the power to go tap anyone in the organization on the shoulder and say, we're working on something really awesome. We can't tell you what it is. Would you like to come work with us? They uh, had the power to use any technology from the Macintosh team or the iPod team without having to ask. 
They didn't have to solicit opinions. They could if they wanted to. They couldn't be told, oh, you have to do this to be consistent with Mac OS. You have to do this to be consistent with the iPod hardware. None of that. They just had autonomy. Just go do it. All right, number five. I think this will resonate. Disruptive companies make their customers feel like superheroes. They give them superpowers in some way. And they do it by obsessing on the customer experience. And companies that are disrupted ignore the customer experience in favor of higher monetization. All right? Or something else. Think about this. Uber, why is Uber so successful? I think this is a big part of why Uber is so successful. Because the, the process of hailing a taxi sucked so bad, especially in the worst conditions, right? You had no uh, guarantee of when it would come. You didn't know what you were going to get. If you lost something in the taxi, could you ever get it back? And so on. And so part of Uber's success, there's many parts, but part of it is just making this experience so much better, right? Uber didn't just disrupt taxis. How much money do you think Uber makes in San Francisco compared to the peak of the taxi market, of all taxis together? Has Uber taken like half of that revenue? All of it? The question is how much money do they make? Yeah, how much revenue does Uber get in, in San Francisco? They have no profit. Yeah, no profit. How much revenue does Uber get in San Francisco relative to uh, what all taxi companies combined got before Uber existed? 80%. 80%? It's not a bad guess. Other guesses? 90. 90? 200. 130. Yeah, 400%. It's 400%, at least as of about a year ago. Because by making the experience so much easier, they increased the willingness of people to use this sort of service. Right? That's what people did not get. I mean, Uber might still fail. They've, they've got a lot of issues. But what people did not appreciate, when even like the $6 billion valuation that they got three years ago, people said, this is crazy. This makes no sense. But they only thought they could take 100% of the market. But they could take much, much more by making this a much more convenient and better experience. Or this model, Blockbuster. I don't know if you have, you must have had something similar right here. Go to the store, limited selection. The thing that's really popular just came out is sold out or it's overstocked. And then you get a late fee. And then you're like, now you're being nagged to go take it back, right? Monetization of the customer. Nobody liked late fees. Versus this model. Even when this was CDs mailed to you at the beginning of Netflix, there was no late fee. Late fee. Infinite selection, whatever you wanted would come to you. Whenever you were done, you sent it back. Amazing, right? Or this. Everyone knows Google is a great technology company, but I think this was Google's secret weapon. Alta Vista, you know, if Google's algorithms had been just as good as Alta Vista's, but they had just gotten rid of this crap, right? Every link here, by the way, almost every link here is monetized. The reason Alta Vista had these links on the page was because they made money. If you clicked on yellow pages, they got paid. Right? I understand that urge. You've got a bottom line to meet. But in doing that, they reduced the quality of the user experience and they left themselves open to disruption by somebody who was more focused on the customer. And Google at this point, with the early days, it didn't look quite like this. They didn't know how to monetize yet. They thought they were actually going to make a uh, subscription search service. You'd pay nine bucks a month and you'd have infinite searches with no ads. That's how much they hated ads themselves. Then they found something better than that. But that not focusing on the customer led to massive problems, right? Related to that is that disruptors play offense. Almost none of the major disruptions have come from someone in their own field, right? Think about Apple. We think of Apple as a massively disruptive company. Apple's uh, core business was the Macintosh for a long time, right? And yet the Macintosh business uh, really had some hard days. In the mid-1990s, Apple almost went bankrupt. I don't remember this. Who saved them? Bill Gates. Bill Gates, exactly. I was at Microsoft at the time. And Microsoft made a $150 million investment in Apple, which today is peanuts, right? That's a, I don't know, a tenth of a percent of, well, about two tenths of a percent of Apple's uh, market cap. But that's what saved Apple. And it, it was because the Macintosh sucked. The, it, great product, 10% market share on its best years. What's the Mac market share now? Yeah, 9%, 10%. Like, the, the Mac has not gotten any better, actually, in terms of market share. That business has not gotten any better whatsoever. 
what happened, the way that Jobs, when he came back, saved Apple, was he said, we are going to play offense. We're going to take our technology. We're hitting a brick wall. We just can't take share from Microsoft. We're going to take our technology, go in a different direction with a different market we can disrupt. And that was music. He said, we're going to make the world's best music player. And that was incredibly bold because the leader in this was Sony. And Sony was a massively innovative company. The, the Walkman, like, revolutionized how we listen to music, right? It was boom boxes before this. Then the Discman, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It really, like, Sony was really an amazing leader. It's, it was not like the easy, soft pickings the Jobs went after. But he thought, look, with digital technology, we can do some things that Sony can't do. We can make a music device where you can have 100 songs on the device, right? We can make a music device where you can have songs from multiple different artists that you pick all on the device with you at any time. We can make an online store where you don't have to buy an album. You can pay 99 cents for one song. So he made the customer a superhero in this case and did the disruption outside of their core business. And to Apple, it was moving into the adjacent possible. To Sony, it was a bull's out of the blue. It was a black swan. Somebody came from someplace they'd never seen coming. All right, seven. Leverage exponential tech or integrate exponential tech. You might think you have to be an amazing technology uh, company in order to leverage these potential returns, right? But usually it's not the case. Uber is not a technology company. Uber hasn't built anything. Uber hasn't invented anything, right? Uber didn't invent the car. They didn't invent the mobile phone. They didn't invent GPS. They didn't invent maps. They didn't even invent the idea of giving a rating on someone that provided you a service. They didn't even invent the seller providing a rating on the buyer. They didn't invent PayPal or credit card transactions online. None of it. There's no new technology here whatsoever. They just built an integration of those that provided tremendous value to the customers and the business. Right, and now, AI, 3D printing, virtual reality, augmented reality, you don't have to invent any of those to use them in your business. Right? It's about integrating them into a customer experience and a business model that makes sense. All right, number eight. Anyone know this guy? This is Wayne Gretzky. I don't think there's a lot of hockey here. He's, uh, He's known as the great one, maybe the greatest hockey player uh, ever to have played. Uh, and when Gretzky got asked once in an interview, Wayne, why are you so good at hockey? Anybody know the quote? See some smiles here. I skate where the puck's going. I skate where the puck's going to be, not where the puck has been. We'd all like to think that. And I'm sure his fellow hockey players wanted to do that too, uh, but they had some challenges. He was just better at predicting it. And so Kodak, like, could have seen where the puck was going. It was pretty clear, but they got stuck in this, in this valley. Here's a company that skates where the puck is going, Google. Google challenges its engineers, what would you build if computing was free? What would you build if storing data was free? What would you build if bandwidth was free? Why do they do that? Because they know that whatever their engineers come up with, in 10 years, it will cost 1% of what it costs today. So if an engineer comes up with something that's 10 times too expensive to be profitable today, in five years, it'll be profitable, right? That's crazy. And so Google gets to have black swans of their own, like this. Is anybody around when Gmail appeared? I th what email service did you use at the time? I was on Hotmail. I think I had a 15 megabyte mailbox, something like that. And then Google said, you're gonna have one gigabyte of email. Anyone remember what day of the year this announcement happened? April Fools. April Fools, exactly. Who said that? Yeah, thank you. And Google was known for playing these April Fools jokes, right? They're a hilarious company. And so the, the internet exploded with, is this real or is this a joke? Because it's so outlandish that we go from 15 megabytes to one gigabyte. But Google had just seen where the puck was going. In fact, they knew in their data centers that the most expensive thing was a human. I'll tell you just... I was at Microsoft at the time. The state of the art of uh, managing data centers at Microsoft was if a computer went down, a operator would walk in the data center and would walk up to the computer and try to fix it. And if, they, if it went down completely, you couldn't contact it. And if it needed an operating system update, they would take a CD and slide it into the CD-ROM slot on the computer and manually do an update of the operating system. 
Google had seen that because of Moore's law and the plunge of computing, that the humans were the problem. The humans were the most expensive part of data center operations. So they'd removed the human from the data center, right? In Google, famously, like the, the only thing a human does is they walk down the aisle with a cart full of uh, fresh PCs or fresh computers and old computers. They look for something that has a red light. They pull it out, put it in the bad pile, and put in something fresh in that slot. That's it. And they, they watch the door, keep the door locked. Right. More or less it. The, the data center of the future, tell me if you've heard this joke. The data center of the future has a man and a dog. The man's job is to keep the dog company. The dog's job is to make sure the man doesn't do anything. Right. <laughs> so Google had seen that trend and had automated their technology. They had already stated where the puck was going to be. So in your sector, where will the puck be? What exponential is going to disrupt you? And especially, what business model will you build when it gets there? Just imagine it's going to happen. Because we all have this, this bias to think, oh, this exponential is happening, but just before it disrupts my technology or my industry, it's going to stop. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. All right, so what will you do if it happened? All right, the last two. And in a lot of ways, these are the most expensive. And because a lot of you are in digital, I think you get this intuitively. But let's, let's bring it home. Almost all the mega successes of the last few years are not uh, commodity business models, they're not even product or service business models. They're all business models that have network effects. They're all business models that are platforms or double-sided marketplaces or something like that, right? Where every new customer or partner makes the system more valuable to future customers or partners, right? Windows mastered this. IBM let Bill Gates own the OS, and then he knew he had won. Because every person who bought Windows made it a more attractive platform to write your software for, and every piece of software written for Windows made it more attractive for more people to buy Windows, and it made it more and more locked in and harder to defect. That's why the Mac, whether you think the Mac's a better product or worse, it just really couldn't penetrate that lock-in of that network effect. And so Jobs, Jobs actually almost blew this. Smart guy, uh, Jobs didn't want an app store in the iPhone. He wanted apps, but he wanted Apple to write every single app because he was obsessed with simplicity and with quality. He said, if we let some third party write an app, it could crash the phone or hang the phone, and it wouldn't be a good phone anymore. But his team said, Steve, Steve, Steve. Remember why we lost to Microsoft? It's about the network effect. We have to have third parties writing apps. We'll write a layer so it can't mess with the rest of the phone. And so Apple, the iPhone, got strongly entrenched in large part to this network effect. That's why Windows now, with a, the Microsoft phone, can't break into this market. Developers are already writing for Apple and Android. There's no room for a third one there. And then Apple innovated. They take 30%, right? That's a nice, nice innovation. Microsoft never had that, right? Or Facebook. Every friend you have that's posting pictures makes it more important for you to be on Facebook and vice versa. This is formally known as Metcalfe's Law. Right? The value of a network increases with the square of the number of people on it. This is the inversion of the overhead of decision making. The value of the network in terms of the number of possible connections between people goes up n squared. And that makes it harder and harder for new competitors to break in. And so when Andreessen says software is eating the world, I don't think he goes far enough. What's really eating the world in these business models is almost entirely networks eating the world. I will illustrate that difference for you again with Uber. And it's famously like everybody knows uh, Uber is the world's most valuable transportation company, yet it owns no vehicles. Right? Amazing. So it might make you think the software is what gives them their valuation. But it's not. Because you could build this software for, I don't know, $100,000. You could build this software. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it's a million dollars. But it's not $65 billion. The software isn't what gives Uber its valuation. The network is what gives Uber its valuation. It's that every Uber driver lowers the wait time for uh, Uber riders, and every Uber rider, every person that has the Uber app, makes it more attractive to be an Uber driver. The network effect, not the software. And maybe the data coming off of this that gives them other services they can sell and so on. Same thing, Airbnb, uh, second most valuable hospitality company in the world with no real estate. What gives them their valuation? It's not the software. You could build a website that lets people list things and book them and so on. You could have a version of it limping in a week. Probably, right? You hire the right guys. It's the network effect. It's that every Airbnb host makes it more attractive for guests to search on Airbnb first, and every person searching on Airbnb makes it more attractive to list your property 
on Airbnb. This is Peter Thiel, founded PayPal. He and Elon Musk merged their companies into PayPal, actually. Uh, he's an investor in Facebook and SpaceX and other things. And he obsesses on this, actually. What he says is, don't try to compete. He says, try to build a monopoly. Leverage an existing or uh, a natural network effect. So I recommend at least, uh, Peter's a character, he's sort of a weird guy in a lot of ways, but I recommend at least the first couple chapters of this book. Because he talks obsessively about how strong network effect companies that get, have something like a natural monopoly, they have an unfair advantage. That in a, almost any other sector, if you don't have a network effect, as the market grows, your margins drop. Because more competitors come in, they compete with you on price, you're all forced to price compete, margins go down. In a network effect situation, your margins go up. Right? Facebook's uh, ad revenue per click goes up. CPC goes up. Google's CPC goes up. Right? That's magic right there. And again, even if it's physical, you can leverage a network effect. Tesla trying to be the first one to win with self-driving. And Tesla's secret weapon, they may or may not be the, the winners here, but their <clears throat> secret weapon, not so secret, they talk about it at conferences, is data. It's the data coming off of these vehicles. So, <clears throat> so they talk about this as fleet learning. As people drive around in Teslas, even when they're not in autopilot mode, Tesla is learning more about real world condition. They're uploading little video snippets of what the car's cameras are seeing and using that as real world data to train their algorithms for self-driving. So they've hit five billion miles in July. They're probably at about eight billion miles today. And the magic of this is that even when a Tesla has a very bad day, this was an accident like two weeks ago, nobody hurt, this accident made every other Tesla a better driver. Right? That doesn't happen with you and me. Like if, if, if Paul has an accident, I'm sure you're a fine driver, but if Paul has an accident, I don't become a better driver. Right? That if there's more of you driving, it's actually a little bit harder for me. But the more Teslas are driving, the faster the entire fleet learns. So they're on autopilot version 9 now. Right? And even the accidents are probably the most educational things. All right, last one. And then we'll... We'll give you guys a little bit of a break, and then we'll move on to, to fun stuff. Is disruptive companies disrupt themselves? But very, 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 very few companies have the courage to do this. Right? It's really hard. Here's the real reason Kodak uh, missed on digital cameras. It wasn't actually the technology, and that was part of it. But it was a bigger factor. And the bigger factor is this. This was really Kodak's business. This is a bigger business or a higher margin and more profitable business than cameras. And so when Steve Sasson presented his camera, uh, he, he has a couple like, interviews where he's self-deprecating. He says he screwed up. He presented it to Kodak executives as the filmless camera. And around the room were executives that had P&Ls about selling film. <laughs> what was their reaction? Like, who is this bozo? Why did we hire him? Like, why the hell would we do this? Right? And so, of course, and we talk about it as the corporate immune system. The corporate immune system is going to attack the new idea, especially if it threatens the existing business model. Because the, the VP that owns this is like, that's billions. That's, Kodak was a $16 billion revenue company. That's $8 billion in revenue and more of that of their contribution margin. You're going to take that away? Why would we ever do this? Let's quietly bury this thing. And thank God it's no good. It'll never go off. But the technology was inevitable. The technology had its own slope, independent of what Kodak did, so they couldn't stop it. Right? This is actually one of the most important books on corporate innovation, and mostly about how corporate innovation fails, frankly. You all know this book, The Innovator's Dilemma? Super recommend it. It really boils down to like one core observation. Leading companies, market incumbents, have a really great technology and a great business model. And the things that disrupt them usually start off as a really crappy technology, usually at a lower price, with a worse business model. And so nobody wants to embrace it. But some other hungry startup that has zero revenue to worry about, because they're new, they don't care. To them, it looks like an awesome business model. If they can make one-tenth of what you do and cut your revenue in half, fine by them. And so inside your company, your people will ask you for permission to do this crazy thing, and you'll say no. But the people at all those startups won't ask you. They'll just do it. 
And that's the big problem with corporate innovation. Let's look at uh, this business. I'm, I'm a music file, you know, I actually love Taylor Swift. Uh, so music in 2009 was a $24 billion business. And these were the leaders in the music industry. And they sold us these. A little like Blockbuster, I guess. <clears throat> and here's what's happened to the music industry in that intervening time. Here's the revenues in the music industry. And I want to especially point out um, this dark blue area. That's revenue from physical media. Records, tapes, CDs. And that revenue is down 80%. Now, the, the good thing is that actually... Total revenue in the music industry bottomed out in 2014, and in 2015 and 2016, and numbers from 2017 will show it's gone up. The music industry is growing again. And it's growing because of this area. This is digital, right? Gone from nothing to now, you know, we'll find out it's like $8.5 billion US in revenue, 2017, something like that. And in fact, digital is, is where all the growth is. In the US, three quarters of revenue in music is digital, half of revenue is streaming. And the growth rate is just phenomenal, actually. It's quite reasonable to think that in another six, seven years, the music industry will actually have higher revenues than it did in 1999. Like that's actually quite plausible, and maybe eventually much higher. But how many of these companies made the leap into digital? How many of the leaders of the industry in 1999 are leaders now? Zero. What did these guys do? They used every tool in their toolkit to try to kill the new thing. They went to Brussels, they went to Washington, D.C., and they campaigned about piracy. They would send stern warnings out to people saying, uh, you can't do this, don't do this thing. They shut down companies. Did it matter? Maybe it bought them a year or two. But the trend was inevitable. Sometimes a disruption that's coming is something that's not inevitable. So a smart competitor or interesting new product, and you can fight it in some way. But sometimes if it's being driven by a fundamental trend in technology, you cannot fight it. Like, it will happen. Maybe you can delay it by a year or two, but it will happen. And so again, your employees will come to you, and they'll say, hey, boss, let's do this awesome, cool thing. And you'll look at it and be like, that looks terrible, right? So you'll say no to the disruption. But the startups in the space, or the disruptors who are in your adjacent possible, they're not going to ask. So the lesson is, if disruption is inevitable, it's better that you own a piece of this new pie than that your revenue just went down, right? So if disruption is inevitable, disrupt yourself. So that's my list of 10 things. And I'm going to close with Charles Darwin. Uh, Darwin, of course, you know, Discoverer of evolution, wrote uh, evolution of species, uh, origin of species, and we think of Darwin as survival of the fittest, right? But Darwin also had this to say. It's not the strongest of the species that survives. It's not even the smartest. It's the ones that are most adaptable to change, most responsive to change. And so in my view, change is happening faster, and so it's more important to be more responsive than ever before. All right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to pause there. Um, why don't we take time for a few questions, and then we'll give you a short bio break, and then we'll come back, and then it's your turn uh, to do this, and I'm going to shut up, and you'll create innovations in your own space. Sanjeev. Something that's coming up in my mind in a, in a, in a, in a company, you put a lot of time and effort in building a team. And but what you're saying is, if you want innovation, you probably don't want a team. And how do you how do you how do you balance those two? Because you have a great team, you have great innovation. I think that's a really important question. So if you want this competitive marketplace of ideas, how do you not make that sort of an adverse uh, workplace? And to me, it's about uh, depersonalizing. It's not about uh, Sanjeev's idea one or Peter's idea one or uh, Paul's idea one. It's about this idea one. And it's about uh, focusing on 
the, the winning ideas and not having it be tied to the egos in the room and having the people's compensation also partially incent them to get collective betterment for the company as a whole. But it is a tricky issue. And, and you see it differently in different corporations, right? Google is actually sort of more consensus driven at the top, though it has tremendous autonomy at the bottom. Amazon, Bezos actually sets it up. So his business unit managers are, there's no consensus building there, very little. Like they are actually in uh, competing roles. Now they move to those roles. So the person that has the PL for X might have it for Y two or three years from now. And their compensation, they're tied to Amazon stock, not tied to stock of uh, the books division or the AWS division. So that also incents them to get the best thing for the company, even at the same time they're like just moving autonomously to try to maximize their business. Yes? Yeah, so what you sort of described about Amazon is this sort of Peter Pan syndrome uh, for the business cycle, right? So you, you avoid the business cycle by basically always uh, not having consensus and, and always growing, right? But it also is meant for Amazon that they have no corporate citizenship, right? They have no message, they have no mission, really. So, I mean, how do you square these two things? You, you were talking about, uh, it was interesting because you were talking about China and Europe, right? Okay, so China didn't take over the world, but Europe also had uh, cataclysmic to two centuries of war, yeah. right, as a result of, of this setup, right? So, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah. I, I'm a startup investor, right? I'm yeah. in favor of innovation, but my question is, when a company gets to the top of the business cycle, can, they really, can we really afford for them to keep doing this? I mean, I think it's a fine question. In terms of um, sort of the corporate citizenship, it is different between, again, say, Amazon, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple. They're all really quite different in terms of how they view themselves in terms of mission in the world. And I think Amazon's lack of um, corporate citizenship doesn't start with their uh, model of rapid experimentation. I think it really comes from Bezos. I think, like, Jeff just sees himself that way. He's really, he's an MBA, like, he's really focused on... And he's a super, super smart guy, but he's really focused on uh, we're going to optimize you know, revenue and costs. And they started off in retail. I mean, now Amazon, most of Amazon's profit that they have some, as you know, is from AWS, from the cloud. But that focus on retail meant their margins were so tight that I think that produces a different culture. Whereas Google, it's all soft. Their margins are huge. Margins are much higher as a percentage than Amazon. And it was founded by idealistic grad students that say, OK, here's our mission. Our mission really is to better the world. So that's something where I think you can, and, but Google is just as experimental as Amazon is, if not even more so. Right? So I think you can have that culture of rapid experimentation and still have a mission-oriented company. And actually, I think it's beneficial because employee uh, tenure at Google is much long longer. Turnover is lower at Google. Employee sat is higher at Google for the same salary if you adjust for price of living in Seattle versus the Bay Area. People are more likely to take a job offer at Google than they are at Amazon because that sense of purpose, that sense of there's a, something noble that we're doing beyond just the business is actually hugely satisfying to people. <laughs> 